Hi there, folks, and thanks for joining me for my talk on event-driven serverless microservices. Before we really get stuck in, I just need to mention that there is a lot to talk about and not a lot of time to do it in. Uh, so I'm going to possibly jump through things really quickly and maybe leave some things out that uh, you can find out about afterwards. Ask me any questions in the Q&A section, and even just send me messages later if you need some clarification or anything. So let's go ahead and get started. My name is Gareth McComsky. I am a solutions architect at Serverless Inc., the creators and maintainers of the serverless framework, probably the most popular uh, serverless uh, development framework out there. Uh, I have been building websites since the early 2000s and started my first pro role in about 2008 and have been building serverless apps since about 2016. So let's take a look at what we mean by event-driven serverless microservices. This is such serious buzzword lingo here that we might as well be talking about cryptocurrencies as well. Thankfully, we're not, so I'm just going to get that right out of here. But the whole point of this talk is not just to use the latest buzzwords, but to talk about the combination of event-driven serverless and microservices together in a way that helps us build resilient architectures that we can use to build applications on. So to get us started, what do we mean by serverless? And I am going to have to gloss over some of the things about what serverless actually means. Um, so feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section. But let's take a brief look at what we mean by serverless. And ultimately, serverless, the, the entire point of serverless is to help replace the existing infrastructure that you use in your web applications, as well as even some of the code that you use with existing managed services available to you in the cloud vendor. So let's consider the sort of holy trinity of web applications, those three main aspects of a web app that we need in order to have our applications running uh, and, and, and available to users. And that is network, where we can accept HTTP requests, the app itself that can process these network requests, and a data store of some kind that can store the data we need. So first of all, we can look at replacing those network requests with something like API Gateway. API Gateway is a service in AWS that can receive incoming HTTP requests, but it could also handle the routing mechanism for us that you would normally find within your uh, the framework that you use for your web application. So it can take away two of those issues for us already. We can also then take a look at replacing a lot of our code with existing services in the cloud vendor itself. Instead of, use, instead of accessing file systems directly, you use uh, the S3 API to store files on S3. If you need to do some kind of publish subscribe model, uh, you can use SNS instead of in your code. Instead of building your own, S your own uh, message queue system inside a database in a cron job, use SQS instead. And for everything else that you still need actual code to execute, you can use Lambda where you can run your code and it gets triggered by events in the cloud. And now we have a database layer where we can replace the existing data store we would normally use in our application with whatever data store happens to make sense for the specific use case in the service, as we will see later. And then everything else that you would normally associate with managing a web application, that's simply not your problem anymore. There's no need to worry about operating system updates. CPU and memory capacity is no longer an issue because you don't have a virtual machine you're working with. There's no application updates that you need to worry about, and load balancing is just completely taken away as well. And this brings us to the fact that we are essentially building a Jamstack application. You take the front end, which is now just a collection of static HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and these make API calls to a backend for all the dynamic data that cannot be built out when the static files are generated. So let's look a bit more detail. What are microservices in the, in the context of our application? Microservices are essentially a mini application unto themselves. And if you think about microservices in this way, it'll help you make a lot of the decisions in designing them and make the right decisions in designing them. Ultimately, microservices are designed to do one thing and do it really well. Domain-driven design can inform the decisions around how you structure your microservices and where the boundaries of these microservices exist. You also want to make sure that our microservices are kept as independent as possible so that they can be moved around, redeployed, allocated anywhere else. And the more uh, independent they are, the easier they are to maintain and, and build over time. The other goal is also to not share data sources between services. If you can make sure that your data stores in your services are not uh, cross-pollinated between all these other services, you'll be able to make sure that the data stores uh, serve the function that they need to and don't get uh, corrupted potentially by other actors trying to ch make changes to the data in your data store. Um, the one downside of microservices traditionally is that there's often this massive infrastructure burden associated where you're going to need to spin up massive Kubernetes clusters, lots of containers, and a whole bunch of stuff, which we're going to get to in more detail. 
Um, but because of the way we're building our architecture, this is potentially taken away. And then finally, the event-driven portion of this. And by event-driven, I don't mean Lambda events. If anybody here has used uh, serverless at all, you might be familiar with the fact that Lambda is often triggered by events in AWS itself. But it's not those events that I'm talking about. Uh, what I'm talking about is events inside your domain that are triggered by actions inside your application. And these include events like create customer, create order, add product order, and, and so on. But stuff based on domain-driven design elements within your application. All right, so what about event-driven microservices? Notice there's no mention of serverless here. Event-driven microservices are actually a thing. They do exist out in the wild. Uh, so that side of things, I won't really be making anything, uh, talking about anything much new there. Uh, but the overhead of building event-driven microservices tends to be pretty huge because you have, uh, you, you have to uh, usually deploy these using Kubernetes and containers which involves a lot of configuration, things like your compute platform. You need somewhere to actually execute code on, which means you need to make decisions based on uh, what Linux operating systems you are going to use on your application containers, what frameworks your code needs to execute in, and so on. You're going to need a data platform to store all this data in. Remember, the services themselves are going to have a single data store each, so you, maybe a MongoDB might be better suited for that. Uh, do you need relational data stores? Uh, maybe you do. Uh, you still need to manage those, maintain those, scale those. That's a lot of work that needs to get done. What if you need a messaging platform? What if you want some way to send messages between your services, as you will see later in the talk? Uh, are you going to use RabbitMQ? Are you going to use Kafka? Uh, how are you going to maintain those, scale those, all the usual problems? What about sidecar processes? Sidecar processes are these kinds of things that are added onto services to make uh, consistency across your services. This is a, a topic that is talked about a lot these days, yet something else that needs to be managed and maintained. And there's a lot more to this. Managing event-driven microservices becomes a very difficult thing to do. Uh, and if you look at large technical organizations like Uber and Netflix, who run huge fleets of microservices, they run event-driven microservices. But bear in mind that these organizations have a large number of DevOps and SRE professionals within the organization. And ultimately, what they're doing is they're creating a platform for the developers to build microservices on top of. And what that means is, if you think about it, developers in those organizations are actually building event-driven serverless microservices because the De DevOps and SRE professionals there are providing a platform for these developers. To the developer, they never, they never need to spin up any infrastructure. They will just consume the infrastructure available to them provided by DevOps and SRE. And that's it. They are essentially building serverless event-driven microservices. So instead of us having to spin up our own uh, serverless environment, why don't we just use what is provided by the cloud vendor? And that's exactly what we're going to be talking about. So we are adding serverless to the equation. And all we care about when we're working with serverless is what our volume limits look like in the cloud. We don't even necessarily care about CPU and other limits. We, uh, the limits that we have are known to us. There are, there are certain limits to Lambda, concurrent Lambda functions, certain limits to DynamoDB, to API Gateway. And we know about these ahead of time. We don't need to uh, plan for CPU and scaling these. Not only that, but they also error out cleanly. So if you make a request to any of these services and you happen, you happen to hit those limits, you'll get a very clean response back at error code from the API, and you can code for those eventualities. So you can have fallback mechanisms in case you happen to reach those limits. And there's none of that management and configuration overhead. There is nothing that you need to do to maintain and manage and keep these services up to date, load balanced, uh, working, and so on. There's a lot of it is also uh, is not just handled by the cloud vendor. Using tools like the serverless framework, for example, a lot of the uh, nitty-gritty details about implementing the, this infrastructure in the cloud is abstracted away for you so that you can just focus on building an application while you consume the services that help your application do what it needs to do. And, and to be fair, there's, there are other frameworks that can do this as well. It's not just the serverless framework. It just happens to be the one that I think is the best and the one I know, and I know the best. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be talking about in this uh, talk today. So let's, uh, let's, let's step back from this abstract discussion about uh, serverless event-driven microservices, and let's start looking at some hyp a hypothetical use case that might make things a little bit more concrete and easy to understand. So first of all, let's consider the outline of a basic web application. We're going to have ourselves a nice front end uh, consisting of static files sitting in S3. S3 can act as a static web host, and you can attach CloudFront in front of that so that you have uh, a nice CDN to speed things up. And of course, your front end can be built with anything like React, Vue, Angular. It's your choice. Uh, anything, even one that's not listed yet, whatever you like, 
as long as it can just it can build out static HTML, CSS, and JS, you now have yourself a nice front end to work with. And of course, we need our back end, and this is where we're going to be focusing on with our microservices. And our front end will be communicating with our back end uh, over HTTP with a RESTful API. You could, of course, use GraphQL. Yeah, that is a perfectly viable choice. I'm going to be just assuming a REST API at this point. And in our back end, we've got a customer, a product, and an order server. So our basic application here is an order management system where we have customers, products, and orders, and we need to maintain the state of these entities. It's a basic entity description here. You can see each of these has some basic data about each of the entities we will need to maintain. And that's our use case that we're going to be looking at today. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. Let's go take a look at one of these services, the actual makeup and structure of what the service will look like. So let's take a look at the customer service. So in here, we have our customer service. And let's look at an example uh, process flow. Let's assume that our front end is now making a request to our customer service. Uh, a customer has filled in the registration form, and they now want to be added as a, as a customer into our application. So our front end is going to make a post request to the slash customer endpoint to add this customer into our application. And what that means is that this request now has to go somewhere. So our compute platform is going to receive the data for this HTTP request to, to action upon it. This compute platform then needs to store the data somewhere. So we have a database layer that needs to have data stored within it. And at this point now, we don't we no longer need to keep the client waiting. The client no longer needs to sit around while we, we continue whatever other processing we need to do. We have stored the data. We are confident that we're not going to lose this. So any other processing we do at this point can be asynchronous. We can do this in the background after we've returned uh, success to the, uh, to the client. So we respond with a 201 at this point. This structure helps keep things nice and low latency. The client is not sitting around while we're doing extra work. We're finished. We move on. The client can then continue to do what it needs to do. Our database at this point, though, is going to continue to kick off asynchronous processing in the background on this new customer. So it's going to kick off, uh, kick off another compute uh, section here that's going to process the event that happened in the database, uh, adding a new user into the database. And what, ultimately, what this compute uh, instance is going to do is that it's going to uh, submit this event into a PubSub layer. So we have a PubSub topic called customer created. And in that, we're going to send a message to say, a new, uh, basically to say a new customer was created, and here are the details of that new customer. We're going to look at more detail in what this pops up uh, piece is going to do, but just bear in mind that this is this is what our service is going to do and what it looks like. And ultimately, this is going to be the same if we have an update or a delete event. We're going to have a processing uh, point that's going to receive receive that uh, change from our database and then push that change into a pub sub topic for that specific event. So that is a very generic way of looking at our service. Let's look at let's make it a bit more concrete. Even let's look at what these services in AWS would look like if we applied them to the service. So starting right at the top, you can see we have API Gateway that's handling the incoming and, and returning re uh, the request and response from our service. So the response, the request comes through for the, uh, the post request to slash customer, comes through API Gateway. And not only is API Gateway handling the actual HTTP request, it's handling the routing to our application as well. So we also don't need uh, code to manage the routing aspect of that. If it was a get customer, it would be going to a different compute instance and so on. So API Gateway points the post customer request to a specific Lambda function written to handle post requests on the customer endpoint. That Lambda function is now going to execute code and process the data received in that post request and store that data in DynamoDB, which is our database layer here. DynamoDB has a feature called DynamoDB Streams where it can uh, trigger a, an, an additional Lambda function that you can see there when a state change happens to data in the table. So in this case, DynamoDB has a new record added. It's going to trigger a Lambda function based on that. And that Lambda function is going to determine this is a, user, a customer created event. Therefore, I'm going to emit a message into the customer created SNS topic. SNS is a pub sub service inside AWS. And in this way, we now have a working uh, microservice that is going to asynchronously send data to other services in our application using services inside of AWS to accomplish that. Pretty cool. But what does that look like? Maybe we can take a look at what that looks like in code. Let's go take a look at an example uh, structure of what this would look like with the serverless framework on the customer service. So as you can see here, this is a configuration file that the serverless framework gives you, a serverless.yaml file. If you've used the serverless framework before, that would be familiar to you. But the idea here is that using the serverless framework, I can have a single configuration file that defines all the elements of the service that I want to deploy into AWS. 
So first of all, I have a name for my service as well as a link to my serverless accounts so that I can set up monitoring and observability on the service while it's executing uh, in AWS itself. And now I'm going to continue to specify how my provider is AWS. So when I use the deploy command for the serverless framework, it knows which provider to deploy to. And my Lambda functions are going to be running node 12. So first of all, I need a way to define an API gateway endpoint. So here I have a Lambda function defined called create customer. So the create customer Lambda function will be executing code when a new customer is being created. This Lambda function is going to be triggered by an HTTP event, as you can see here, on the path of customer when there's a post request. And on deployment time, the serverless framework will, will use this to create an API gateway resource pointed at this Lambda function. And that API gateway resource will uh, trigger this Lambda function when a request is made to a stash customer as a post request. Nice and simple. I didn't have to worry about any specific configuration of API gateway. All the permissions and everything is resolved for me by the serverless framework. So we have our API gateway endpoint, we have the root slash custom on a post request, and we have a Lambda function executing on that. But we need a, data, a DynamoDB table to store the data in. So within the service.yml file, I'm going to go to a section near the bottom here called resources. And here you can see I have a customer table defined. This is a definition for a DynamoDB table. And again, on deployment time, uh, when I deploy this using the serverless framework, the serverless framework will create the DynamoDB table for me with the primary key uh, specified here. But it also creates the stream specification. So because I want to trigger additional functionality when a uh, customer is uh, created, updated, or deleted, I'm going to uh, start a stream specification here, which just tells DynamoDB that I need a, a stream, and that stream will probably, probably be connected to a Lambda function. So going back up here, I can see I've got another Lambda function called customer event. And this customer event is in this uh, file and function. And the event that triggers this specific Lambda function is a stream from DynamoDB. And this is the DynamoDB stream that will trigger this Lambda function. And this is how uh, I will now get the uh, event data from this create customer event propagated into SNS. Because this customer event is going to send a message into an SNS topic. And once again, I go down to resources. And here is the SNS topic for customer created. So because uh, when I deploy, this SNS topic is created. So I know my Lambda function will have this SNS topic available to it. I can now send a message out, and any other services that are interested in customer created will now be able to see that. As you can see, I've got events here for customer updated, uh, customer deleted, and I've got the other endpoints here for uh, retrieving customer details, updating customers, deleting customers, and so on. So I can configure an entire service here to do the entire cred for an entity, as well as the asynchronous uh, process in the background that needs to propagate out these messages. Now that we've taken a look at that, let's consider uh, the order service. And let's go through the uh, example flow of what it would look like for the order service if I'm creating a new order. So traditionally, you may be familiar with this as a relational entity. In the traditional application, this would be an order table inside your database. And the order table would store the customer ID and the uh, many, the one-to-many relationship to product IDs. And these would be resolved at request time uh, via a join query to the uh, uh, customer ID and uh, to the customer and product tables. But in our architecture, we are not sharing data sources across the service boundary. So we cannot have the order service make a request into the customer service, uh, the customer services data table in order to resolve a customer record. So we cannot, uh, storing a customer ID and a product ID uh, might not work out here. Although you may think that there's an easy, easy answer to this. What about if we just had an API request that we could use? Maybe the order service could just make an API call to the customer service to resolve the customer data. Unfortunately, this is not necessarily the, uh, the great idea that it might sound like at first. Uh, here, for example, we have our three services. We have the order product and customer service. And let's just say, for example, the order service has received a GET request for a specific order. And if we had only stored the customer ID and the product IDs for a specific order, we now need to make HTTP calls into those services to resolve the customer and product data so we know what to return to the request to the order service. However, this has a downside because what if uh, one of the developers on the team and makes a change to the customer service and deploys this out and it suddenly breaks all GET requests from the customer service? Our order service can no longer request data to fulfill requests for order data. In all, for all intents and purposes, the order service is now down as well. The order service can no longer fulfill the requests for uh, order data because it cannot resolve the customer IDs. And this makes, basically makes the order service go down as well. 
What's even worse is that the order service itself could bring the customer service down if we suddenly had a whole bunch of uh, queries and traffic hit the order service all at once. Instead of just one of our services having to handle the load of all these requests for orders, that load is now pushed up against our customer service as well. And, and if the customer service is not unnecessarily built for that or is being overwhelmed with other requests that it needs to do, we could be duplicating traffic and bringing uh, other services down as well. Not a, good, not a good place to be in. And ultimately, using HTTP requests for APIs is generally a bad idea. So what do we do? How can we solve this problem? Uh, we need some way to have customer data in orders because customers place orders. When I, when I want to request order data, I need to know which customer placed the order. Otherwise, I can't ship it to them. I can't deliver it to them. So what we do instead is we look at our data layer. Uh, we would have to store orders, so we have to have some way to reference a customer against the product. But instead of using uh, having a customer ID that needs to be referenced against the customer service, we could keep a record of customers ourselves in the order service itself. So because the customer service is already propagating out state changes for customer data through those SMS topics we were talking about, like created, updated, and deleted, the order service can just subscribe to the specific SMS topics, listening for when a customer is created, updated, or deleted, and maintain state of customers itself within its own service. The advantage this gives us is that even if the customer service goes down for some reason, the order service can continue to still fulfill requests for orders. Uh, it might not be able to create new orders if there are new customers coming along because the customer service is down. Maybe the new customers added to the customer service hasn't propagated through to the order service because the customer service is down at that time. But by and large, the order service can continue to maintain uh, doing uh, these requests. But what this means for us, this isn't just limited to, limited to the customer service. Our order service can maintain state for multiple other services. So here, for example, we would do the same thing with the product service. And you can see our order uh, service has state for orders, customers, and products. It can maintain state across all of them. And the customer uh, service and the product service can both be propagating out the events when the state of customer and product entities are changing over time. Our order service can maintain that state itself. So what advantages does this give us? Well, first of all, we get all the benefits of microservices here. We get the uh, service autonomy that we get out of microservices and the service resiliency out of microservices. Because of the event-driven asynchronous nature that we are maintaining state of data within services, there is massive resiliency even if other services uh, might go up and down. Maybe we, if we push buggy code in one service, there are no hard dependencies by other services that require that service to always be up and available. If a, a service needs to go down for maintenance, you can do that. You are making sure that you're not going to break your entire application if you happen to push a change that breaks one of them. And all the downsides of microservices that we talked about are essentially removed by serverless. There's no Kubernetes clusters to manage. There's none of that massive amounts of infrastructure that you need to maintain over time. There's no, no load balancing that you need to be constantly consumed by, worried about that traffic spike coming in. And there's also the full observ uh, you, you also get full observability built into these services by the serverless framework itself. The serverless framework offers offers a observability platform that you can you can use to view the activity on your services and your API gateway endpoints. The biggest advantage of all that you get is that your developers can now also focus on outcomes instead of infrastructure. Instead of worrying about uh, how you're going to manage uh, uh, spinning out additional infrastructure when you have needs like a, new, a front end needing a new API endpoint and so on, your developers can just focus on uh, building your application and solving the problems of the business. This gives you massive amounts of agility. You can constantly be adding, uh, adding new features, solving problems that your customers have. And we haven't even talked about costs yet because your costs are also going to be reduced, about, uh, reduced by this. Because serverless services only bill per usage, you're not paying for API Gateway the moment you provision it. Unlike EC2 instances and container clusters, you're paying by the hour for the infrastructure that this uses. With services like API Gateway, SNS, S3, DynamoDB, uh, SQS, so many more uh, uh, in AWS, you only pay for the actual processing that you do on those platforms. So at 2 a.m. in the morning when nobody's actually using your application, you're not still being billed by the hour with all the infrastructure set up. You're only being billed for the actual processing that's being done. And not only that, you save additional costs because your DevOps resources in your organization no longer need to be constrained trying to provide all of the infrastructure by your, needed by your developers. They can focus on working on the uh, very uh, the more important needs of the infrastructure, like security. And that's it for me. I, that's all I have to uh, present to you guys. We're probably going to move into the live Q&A session now. So please feel free to ask the questions that you have. If you need any clarification, 
if you're interested and want some more information. Uh, if we don't get to your question, feel free to hit me up after the discussion. I uh, will be happy to share my uh, Twitter and email and whatever details you need. Uh, I love talking about serverless and will happily discuss anything serverless related with anybody.